Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bruce McCormack. I am the Charles Hodge Professor of Historical and Systematic Theology here at Princeton Seminary. And it is my privilege to introduce our speaker for today. By now, I actually think Professor Dr. Friederike Nussel is well known to all of you. So my remarks here at the outset of her fifth lecture in the Warfield series will be less introduction than an expression of gratitude. Dogmatic theology is, as Friedrich Schleiermacher rightly maintained, a historical discipline. It distinguishes itself from other forms of systematic theology through the significance it attaches to being guided by and engaging in loving critical reflection on the shared dogmas of the Christian faith and on the confessional documents and confessional writings which together constitutes the tradition in which a given theologian stands. Any systematic theology worth its salt concerns itself with the consistency, coherence, and clarity of its own doctrinal reflections, and especially with the need to justify them by providing them with a strong epistemic foundation so that what comes forth is not just reflections on the personal experiences of an individual, but something which connects with the reflections of others. But dogmatics adds to this a historical dimension. Dogmaticians know that the church is composed not only of the living, but also of those who come before. Those who, although now with God, are present with us as God is present with us. Dogmaticians honor the living and the dead through giving attention to those who have wrestled with the problems we now wrestle with, seeking to receive from these others wisdom and light and not just examples of things that can go wrong. In this way, the dogmatic enterprise is a living discourse which draws its life from the ongoing effects of the great cloud of witnesses who have come before. What Professor Newsell has provided us with in these lectures is a mini dogmatics. She has shown how her pneumatological starting point opens up vistas for thinking through the doctrines of God, creation, redemption, Christology, reconciliation, and tonight, church and sacraments. She has found her way precisely to those great thinkers, past and present, who have entered deeply into the doctrinal issues which concern her. That inevitably has meant that a selection has occurred. She has, a call, she has called upon many witnesses from the past and identified their contributions to her problems. In doing so, she has been fulfilling an unfulfilled wish articulated by Karl Barth in the last year of his life. In his concluding unscientific postscript on Schleiermacher, Barth said it would have been possible to ground the whole of dogmatics and not, not in Christology as he had done, but in pneumatology. He had often wondered what his theology would have looked like had he done so, but he did not live long enough to think further along these lines. I would submit to you that what Professor Newsell has been doing is thinking precisely upon those lines. What would a dogmatics look like which sought its foundation in the third article of the creed rather than in the second? Um, and the gratitude that I want to express that is that in, in doing so, Professor Newsell has fulfilled the intentions of the bequest which founded this Warfield lecture series uh, perfectly. And I am grateful to her for that. Um, and for the quality of what she has brought before us. It has been delivered with uh, not only a, a, a real brilliance of insights, but also with uh, considerable humility and a self-deprecating sense of humor, which I think we all appreciate in, in systematic theologians. So with that all said, uh, I would ask you to join me in welcoming to, the, to our podium, Professor Dr. Friederike Nussel. Thank you, Bruce, for your introduction and for your very kind words of gratitude, which I can only return, actually. I, see, I still think of the Schleiermacher class that I attended when I returned to, so, so to say, a continuous studies, or what, how you say that. And um, I, I was so surprised to find um, style of dogmatics that also has informed me in later times then. So thank you. 
In the two previous lectures covered the work of the spirit in creation and redemption. The creative work of the spirit consists in the spirit giving life, drawing the spirit's further development from diversity. Thus, the differentiating power of the spirit realized in the inner Trinitarian relations moves outwardly, affecting, affecting life. The redemptive effect of the spirit consists in enabling Jesus to live the life of the son in distinction from the father. The spirit also works out redemption by revealing the grace of God in the life of Jesus, the determination of humanity, and therein also the reality of sin. In redemption, humans, uh, humans acknowledge and recognize their difference from God and their determination from commun uh, to communion with God. Knowledge lives from this act of differentiation. In the knowledge of redemption, differentiating possib possibilities conducive to life are given to us via the spirit. They are gifts precisely in that they do not only affect the human intellectuality, but affect human emotion and motivations for action. The gift changes human reality, but it, it, it does not become a human property or possession, given that knowing about the origin of the gift belongs to the knowledge of the gift. In this first lecture, uh, to, uh, in the first lecture today, I would like to discuss the efficacy of the spirit in reconciliation. By way of introduction, it is helpful to remind ourselves that the efficacy of the spirit is not understood as a singularly effect, uh, effectivity, but occurs in the interaction between the father and the son. I adhere to the traditional formula, opera ad extra indivisa sunt, but my aim is to work out the role of the spirit within this undivided operation. My thesis about the reconciling efficacy of the spirit is the following. The spirit is not only a medium of God's presence, as clearly stated in the Hebrew Bible, but gives mediums whereby God's presence and the effect of the spirit are experienced as one. I begin with reconciliation. The most important passage in the New Testament for reconciliation is 2 Corinthians 5, um, especially verses 18 to 21. And I, I think I don't have to read it to you. There are many controversial views regarding the exegesis of Paul's theology of reconciliation. If I understand correctly, a central question inquires about the traditional and historical background from which Paul understands the death of Jesus Christ. The systematic question to which it is hoped biblical exegesis can provide an answer is thus. Why was this, the death of Jesus Christ necessary for reconciliation for Paul, and in what sense was it so? As a systematic theologian, it is impossible to work through all exegetical responses. Thus, I can only say here cautiously and doctrinally, the theological interpretation of the atonement stemming from the Tübingen school today seems to be most, most plausible to me. It explains on the one hand that the extension of the atonement to all people required that the atonement be fulfilled once and for all. On the other hand, it interprets the substitution as an inclusive substitution, taking seriously Paul's discussion of a shared death of Christian with Christ as stated in Romans 6. If I speak of the Tübingen School, I mean Janowski, Gese, um, uh, Stuhlmacher, and, uh, and Ottfried Hofius. Not only is human sins charged to Christ as a scapegoat, but the entire existence of the believer is united with Christ. That's their point. However, one understands Paul's interpretation of Jesus' death on the cross, one thing is clear. Reconciliation means overcoming enmity, which can be inferred from Paul's use of the Greek uh, katalasein and katalage, the ver ver verb and noun from, uh, form of reconciliation. 
Reconciliation is not about reconciling different personal views where the two parties are neutral to each other, but about restoration of the relationship of enemies. Further, it is crucial that God is the subject of the act of reconciliation. God praised up the word of reconciliation in order to reconcile us to God's self, to overcome human enmity toward God, consisting of sin. In the history of the doctrine of reconciliation, the satisfaction theory of Anselm of Canterbury has eclipsed this basic claim of Paul. Such an eclipse occurs because God then appears as the recipient of the merit, which the Son, as the God human, acquires through his suffering and is imputed to us by God the Father because of the intercession of the Son. During the Reformation, the theory was already criticized by the Socinians, then later in the Enlightenment, and finally most influentially by Albrecht Ritschel. In my view, Anselm's view is indeed a bit distorted when he is accused of an image of God according to which God is the wrathful father who can only be satisfied by the merit of the son. In such a characterization, it is forgotten that the events as a whole are th thought to be ordered by God. Nevertheless, the criticism was justified in so far as the doctrine of just, uh, satisfa satisfaction does not have sufficient support in the biblical statements on, uh, of reconciliation. The benefits of Albrecht Ritschel's position consists in the fact that he emphasized the importance of the community in faith and thus the importance of the church in the doctrine of reconciliation more clearly than the previous interpreta interpretations. The individual only becomes certain of having been reconciled with God and adopted as a child of God as a member of the community, according to Ritschel. Since for Ritschel, the forgiveness of sins or reconciliation, he equates this both, um, can be recognized at all and its effect, uh, effectiveness uh, can only experience except uh, cannot be experienced except in the congregation founded by Jesus Christ and dependent on his specific effect. Ritual made, made it clear for the first time that knowledge of redemption is epistemologically bound to the congregation founded by Jesus in which his redemptive act is known. The knowledge of reconciliation is possible only from the standpoint of the congregation, which of course has consequences for the task of systematic theology itself. According to Ritchell, systematic theology has to quote, interpret the Christian religion's view of the world and of human life from the point of view of the completed revelation of God in Christ and to explain the correct, correct connection of its members as necessary in the relation to the existence of the Christian community and to its goal, eternal life in the kingdom of God." End quote. Karl Barth adopted this epistemological foundation of theology. However, different than Ritchell, he did so from uh, within a theology of re revelation as a critique of religion. Schleiermacher provided uh, much of the preliminary work for this understanding since the consciousness of faith arises only in the new life as a whole, which is realized in mutual communication. However, R Ritchell was the first to clarify the epistemological dependence of the standpoint from the community. The weakness of the theology of reconciliation here, however, is that the term is still used synonymously with forgiveness of sin. For Ritchell, um, reconciliation is realized in the event I described in the last lecture as the realization of sin and grace. In contrast, Karl Barth has given the concept of reconciliation the necessary breast for, by understanding reconciliation as the work of Christ, the knowledge of sin, the judgment of God revealed in Christ, and the, coll the collective and individual work of the Spirit. Yet the concept of redemption stands only in relation to the eschatological event. <clears throat> 
Even in contemporary treatments, the terms redemption and uh, reconciliation are assigned various meanings in dogmatic language, partly because no clear definition can be derived from the language of the Bible. Rather than using the terms interchangeably, I consider the distinction to be dogmatically meaningful and understand redemption as individual liberation to a new relationship with God and reconciliation as the communal dimension of this same event. For Paul, both work together in 2 Corinthians 5. Reconciliation implies individual deliverance from the sin through Christ, but individuals are then incorporated into the body of Christ and thus organically joined into a community. The ecclesial dimension of the reconciliation event has been fruitfully expressed in Protestant dogmatics in the 20th century, especially by Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Karl Barth. According to Bonhoeffer's well-known saying, the church is, quote, Christ existing as congregation, end quote, and in uh, Karl Barth's Kirchliche Dogmatik, he says, the church is the earthly historical form of existence of the body of Christ. In my dialogue with Catholic theologians, I have often heard the allegation that in Protestantism, the church is only secondary to justification. The ac accusation still persists in the discussions, although it has no basis in Protestant dogmatics and was already refuted in the first document of the Lutheran Catholic dialogue, Church and Justification. It is true, however, that the elementary role of the church in Protestantism is explained differently than seen in Catholicism. I go on to the reconciling work of the spirit and the Pentecostal narrative. What then is the role of the spirit in the reconciling event? Karl Barth answered this question with a threefold de determination. The spirit is the awakening power that gathers the church, the enlivening power that increases, sustains, and regulates the church, and the illuminating power that sends the church to witness. Bard thus shows how the church depends on the work of the spirit for everything. All these claims have to be affirmed, yet the determination of the spirit is undermined and underdetermined in his treatment, which might actually be intentional. Bart does not want to present the spirit as a person nor as an acting subject. But perhaps more should be said about what characterized the spirit as spirit. My suggestion is to define the spirit as a medium of presence. This determination allows us to take up biblical statements about God's presence in the spirit, as well as the role of the paraclete, who, according to John's gospel, allows Jesus to be present after his departure. The characterization as medium is a good option because, according to its modern definition, a medium is a mediator and thus establishes communication. This mediatory effect is produced by the spirit in the story at Pentecost, which is the greatest New Testament story about the spirit. The Pentecost miracle is an effective sign of the spirit's presence in which the signature of the spirit of creation, the spirit's rumbling, is then heightened to a full-blown storm. Divided tongues appear to the disciples, enabling them to speak in the languages of the diverse people groups by which they are surrounded. On the, one, on the side of the hearers, astonishment spreads because they suddenly hear the disciples proclaiming the great acts of God in their own language. The miracle could have been that the different people's groups suddenly understand the language of the disciples. However, the opposite is the case. The spirit gives uh, space to the diversity of languages, thereby cultivating linguistic diversity. And precisely in this way, the spirit brings people together. As in the spirit's creative and redemptive work, the spirit is not knowable an sich as uh, um, uh, per se. 
in the work of reconciling and unifying, but only in the mediatory effect. The spirit moves in ecstatic experience, but it does not lead to unmediated knowledge. In that the spirit gives knowledge and a being outside of oneself, the spirit is not to be known exactly in the process itself. With the spirit, it is like with the thing in itself, in Kant. Desiring knowledge of the thing implies an abstraction from the cognitive capacity, but then nothing can be known anymore. Even if one re refrains uh, from the intellectual cognition bound to understanding and refers to the sensory dimension of the working of the spirit, the unknowability of the spirit remains. The sensory dimension is not clear itself. In the Pentecost story, it consists in the roaring sound and in the, uh, and the division of tongues of fire. Only ex effecto can we infer the working of the spirit. But whether the spirit was really at work or not is certainly one of the most controversial questions that has permeated the, Christian, uh, the history of Christianity. Even today, Christian groups and churches continue to disagree over this question. The work of the spirit is double-edged, or to speak with Paul Tillich, ambiguous. Thus, the question of how the spirit makes God's self present is of essential importance. Against this background, it is important to keep in mind the unified narrative thread in Acts 2, which has three steps and they have to be uh, uh, taken to be to, uh, together. The miracle of Pentecost is a miracle of language or communication, marking the basis of apostolic work. Just as Paul repeatedly explains in his letters that he did not become an apostle of his own accord, but through the appearance of the risen one, Luke makes it clear in Acts that the beginning of apostolic proclamation is not self-empowerment, but the work of the Spirit. The Spirit empowers the church, not only the apostles, to pro pro proclaim the acts of God. This beginning is a mystery, as Bart um, elaborated in his interpretation. As the story of creation explains the divine origin of the world and its order, the story of Pentecost explains the origin of the apostolic activity in the spirit. The miracle of Pentecost, however, is only the first point in the Pentecost narrative. Peter's sermon is the subsequent narrative point and the account of the communal Christian life represents the third point in the narrative. The miracle of Pentecost requires the interpretation that Peter adopts in his sermon. In the sermon, Peter interprets the miracle of Pentecost as the fulfillment of the promise of Jewel 3, 1 to 5. Then, interpreting Psalm 15, 8 to 11, he explains to, be, uh, the, to the assembled crowd that the fate of Christ <coughs> was the fulfillment of David's foreshadowed descendant. Peter interprets the scriptures, confirming them as the place of knowledge of the divine will. The crowd should know how they brought the cross from this, uh, how, whom they brought to, to the cross. From this indicative follows the imperative, repent and be baptized so that your sins may be forgiven and you may receive the Holy Spirit. In the Pentecost narrative, baptism is presented as the medium of receiving the Spirit. However, this reception of the Spirit does not occur apart from a process of understanding. Baptism is in the name of Jesus is to be understood in light of the promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It is true that baptism has a prominent meaning in the story of Pentecost because it is the sign of repent repentance and forgiveness of sins. But the narrative unit does not end there. Rather, the life of the early church is described in its conclusion. They live their community in the breaking of bread, in prayer, and in the sharing of goods. Their life is marked by Christian feelings, which I addressed in the last lecture. They hold meals with joy and loud hearts, praising God. Luke paints the model of communal life. Not only in the, is the community well received by people, but the Lord makes it grow daily 
The miracle of Pentecost leads to communal life through scriptural interpretation and understanding. Now I go on to the mediatory nature of the spirit. Acts 2 gives us the fundamental means of proclamation, the scriptures, the sermon, interpreting the, interpreting the scriptures, baptism, the breaking of bread, prayer, and the sharing of goods. Later, tongues are also mentioned as a form of, pro of proclamation. The spirit, as already stated, does not make the spirit the subject in these mediums through which the spirit works. The spirit works the knowledge of God in the redemption tr through Jesus Christ and communicates the experience of God's nearness to us. These experiences are qualified by the respective mediums and are distinguished accordingly, while also with reference to one another. The life of faith and community that the spirit works is shaped by the interaction of the mediums. The significance of the spirit's mediatory role in reconciliation with God and among people, that is for community life, is reflected in the fact that the understanding and use of the means of reconciliation is constitutive for the cohesion of Christian communities and churches. When there is disagreement on the outworking of the spirit and communal reconciliation, there are divisions and splinter. A reverse side of the vitality of Christian community is um, st uh, st divisions and splinter, sorry. Um, communities are formed. These processes are evident throughout the history of Christianity. The reverse side of the vitality of Christian community is strife, independence from an, uh, one another, dissociation and exclusion. However, before I go into these aspects I, in more detail, I would like to discuss how the individual means of the spirit contribute to reconciliation and the experience of the nearness of God. And I begin with scripture. For most, if not all, Christian churches and community, the Bible is the primary and fundamental means by which the spirit gives access to God and to the knowledge of God's will. Hence, why it is referred to as Holy Spirit Scripture. The inspiration of the biblical canon was assumed for many centuries and only became controversial during the early stages of the Enlightenment. The discovery of the historical origin of the canon, coupled with the criticism of content contra uh, contrary to reason, led to the crisis of the Reformation principle of Scripture according to which scripture alone is the rule and guide for the knowledge of faith and doctrine. Against the background of historical criticism, the biblical word uh, could no longer be equated with the word of God. And thus, the truth of theological doctrine could no longer be explained simply by its reference to scripture. The crisis of the scriptural principle was cemented by the differentiation of disciplines, especially the distinction between big biblical exegesis and systematic theology. For many Christian churches, the modern Protestant view of the Bible is elusive and poses a problem for theological dialogue. However, the Protestant view is also often misunderstood in its impact. Protestants who acknowledge the findings of modern scriptural research do not deny that knowledge of the spirit can arise in the use of the Bible. They assert it as a rule, but if the Bible is a human testimony to God's word, then it is not enough to justify the truth of statements of faith simply by the fact that they are written in the scriptures. It requires sustained methodical interpretation and reflection on the criteria to gain traction in shared ecclesiastical and academic discourse. This approach has its model in the biblical writings themselves. As revealed by research on intertextuality and intra-biblical interpretation of scripture. Disagreement over interpretation can be difficult and schismatic at the same time, it can also be productive, leading to new insights and to end the removal of uh, problematic understandings. 
Two interlocking developments are important here. On the one hand, research on the narrative structure of the forms of proclamation in the New Testament and on the profile of biblical literatures in general shows how these effects create strong interpretative stances. On the other hand, the impact of biblical writings in recent proposals is broken down in terms of aesthetic reception. Thus, in accordance with the Reformation doctrines of scripture, it can be stated, even under modern conditions, that God's spirit gives faithful insight into the use of scripture and enables Christian proclamation. <coughs> Baptism. Scripture, however, is not only a medium of the spirit, but it is also the source of knowledge of the other means the spirit uses uh, to make God present in Christ and to establish communion. A prominent place is occupied by baptism, as we have, see, have seen already. It allows to, the forgiveness of sin and the promise of grace to become a renewing presence for the baptized in the symbol, symbolic act of the water and um, at the same time binds the person baptized into the community of the body of Christ. Today, there is a wide spectrum of ideas about the reception of the spirit in baptism and the relationship between baptism with water and spirit baptism. The differences are no longer only found in the doctrines of mainline churches and charismatic or Pentecostal churches, even within the Pentecostal communities, there are considerable differences. What has to precede baptism? Should infant baptism be practiced? How is the spirit received in faith or also in further spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues, which reveals the authentic working of the spirit? Does baptism happen once or can it be repeated? A concise theological explanation is offered, uh, in my view, by the Leuenberg Agreement of the Lutheran Reformed United Pre-Reformation and Methodist Churches in Europe. Number 14 in the ecumenical doc document states, baptism is administered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit with water. In baptism, Jesus Christ is irrevocably <coughs> um, uh, um, received man fallen prey to sin and death into the, his fellowship of salvation so that he may become a new creature. In the power of his Holy Spirit, he calls him into his community and to a new life of faith, to daily, daily repentance and discipleship. This is the quote uh, from the Leuenberg statement. This statement is significant in what it affirms and in what it is left out. It says that baptism means new being in Christ and calling into his body or church. The working of the spirit refers to involvement in the community and new life marked by faith, repentance and discipleship. Nothing more is said. There is no mention of pre preliminary work here, just as there is no mention of further signs of an immediate reception of the speed spirit, nor is anything said about pedo-baptism or believer's baptism. In this question, flexibility seems to be possible, even necessary. The practice of infant baptism, which developed after the first century, symbol uh, symbolizes the unconditionality of grace. For me, this symbolization is the most important argument for infant baptism. However, this symbolic power is fulfilled only in a familial and church environment that cares for the child to become acquainted with and to grow into Christian faith. With increasing secularization, we in Germany and many other regions of Europe are faced with the decision of whether this form of baptismal practice can continue on us, on as is it. Even though baptism can happen much later in life, it is still directed at the life of the person as a whole. Pro uh, baptism promises communion with Christ and thus the presence of God for the whole life of the uh, person. The spiritual power of baptism lies in this promise. 
Special temporary qualifications, such as speaking in tongues, can neither increase nor concretize this promise. The meaning of baptism consists in the promise of God's presence in Christ, which shapes and, as it were, envelopes life. Calvin chose the apt uh, symbolic expression of sealing to indicate this meaning of baptism. Lord's Supper. <laughs> Baptismal grace cannot be increased, which was the main objection raised by Luther and the, uh, the other reformers to the Catholic understanding of ordination. Whoever belongs to the communion of Christ in the realm of grace that redeems from sin and death. This graceful fellowship is as close as one can get to God. Baptismal grace cannot be increased, but it can be concretized which happens in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. In the ecumenical statements on baptism, Eucharist, and ministry in the Faith and Order Commission, the churches have jointly formulated, quote, the Eucharist is essentially the sacrament of, which, of the gift which God makes to us in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian receives this gift of salvation through communion in the body and blood of Christ. In the Eucharist meal, in the eating and drinking of the bread and wine, Christ grants communion with himself. God himself acts, giving life to the body of Christ and renewing each member in accordance with Christ's promise. Each baptized member of the body of Christ receives in the Eucharist the assurance of the forgiveness of sins and the pledge of eternal life. The communion given by God is in the presence of Jesus Christ. The Eucharistic meal is the sacrament of the body and blood for, of Christ, the sacrament of his real presence, as uh, this document insists. The presence of Christ has been a special issue in the theological disputes between Lutherans and the Reformed, as you all know. It is one <coughs> of the tra tragedies of the struggle over pure doctrine that differences on this issue have divided Reformed and Lutherans for centuries. In the meantime, many agreements on communion have been reached worldwide. This ecumenical process has been achieved on the basis of agreement on the doctrine of justification and agreement on central issues of communion theology, which already existed in the Reformation period. There was agreement, um, yet, I mean, between Lutherans and Reformed at the time that the Mass is not a sacrifice, but the Lord's Supper symbolizes how Jesus Christ overcame the deadly power of sin once and for all on the cross. The controversial question concerns the understanding of the anamnesis as realization. It was dispute, undisputed among the reformers that the Son, as the second person of the Trinity, is omnipresent and present to the world according to his deity. The controversial point was whether the Son, in his united person and according to his human nature, is able to become present in the Lord's Supper. Zwingli's position is enticing since in his symbolic or deictic interpretation of the words of institution in the Lord's Supper, the question of presence does not come up at all. In the celebration of the Lord's Supper, reconciliation is commem uh, commemoratively made present. This <coughs> uh, precise point presented the problem for Luther. For if the subject of remembrance is the believers, then the act of reconciliation becomes present to, uh, to, through their action, which, which is contradicted by the words of institution, in which, according to Luther, Jesus himself assures his real presence. This presence comes to the believers in the elements of the Lord's Supper. It is not through the act of remembering that Christ becomes present, but through the promise. Christologically, however, the question remains, who is he? I think that's your question. <laughs> in the last lecture, I showed how Luther holds to the unity of the person in the two natures based on the doctrinal decision made in Chalcedon. Luther quips to Zwingli, quote, no friend, wherever you place God, there you must also place with him humanity. 
They do not allow themselves to be separated or divided from one another. There has been made in Christ one person, and in the Son of God does not se um, se uh, separate from it itself the humanity." End quote. Luther knew that this thesis not only provokes the question of how to think true human being intimately united with God, no less difficult is the question of how to think the presence of the God human in the Eucharistic elements. For Thomas Aquinas, it was unthinkable that God would be enclosed in finite elements. The doctrine of transubstantiation therefore offers a justification of the real presence, avoiding the problem entirely. Likewise, <laughs> later, Zwingli and Calvin, a spatial enclosure um, uh, of the logos in the el elements was unthinkable. Luther also saw the problem and provided a rather creative answer. To be sure, his answer did not solve the Christological problem over the divinity and humanity of the person of Christ, yet Luther's reflection helped the, to differentiate the understanding of presence. He distinguished the presence in three ways. The first way is physical presence, which occupies space. Physical presence is how Jesus was present on earth and how he was, uh, he were also present, uh, how we are also present. This form of presence is comprehensible to us. Luther sees the second form of presence in the spiritual or mental presence, which does not occupy space. He calls this form a presence incomprehensible, citing it as a rough par uh, parable to how a sound or tone passes through air or water or a wall. In this form of presence, God can be in Christ with creatures without them feeling, circumscribing or comprehending God. The third form of presence is the one Luther refers to in his doctrine of the Lord's Supper. He calls it the divine and heavenly form of presence which is also incomprehensible, but at the same time much more miraculous than the second form of presence. This way of being present, present, um, <coughs> being present is the one in which God allows creatures to be present and God circumscribes them as well as the human nature of Jesus Christ. The presence is not a spatial or local presence. God's self is not a corporalis locus, but makes the a finite present and circumscribes it. The accusation of spatial enclosure no longer applies. It is not the logos who is enclosed in finite elements, but the human life of the sun is enclosed within the divine reality, which is not spatially conceived. Accordingly, Luther also held that the rights of God are not a location in space. Luther called this understanding of the present mysterious. It transcends the everyday understanding of presence, and I find a modern breakdown of this logic of the presence in Ingolf Dalfert to be insightful. In the conclusion of his book, Gegenwart Presence, uh, Dalfert correlates the relation of God's presence, the presence of creatures, and the series of events that make up creation. And I quote from this, um, and uh, it is a translation, and he didn't write this in English. Uh, God does not belong to the series of events that contingently concretize creation, nor does God belong to those who, like us, can place themselves in temporal relation to the, these series of events from our localization in them. There is no presence without God, but no presence which exists for, for us creatures is identical with God's. God is not, a present, um, uh, is not present among presents in our present. <laughs> this is the word play that uh, Dalfert likes, but the one without whom there would be no other present than God's own. God is not only other than everything else, but everything else is only because God makes it possible. I think this captures quite well what Luther understood by this um, heavenly presence. 
Such an understanding of God's presence can not only clarify the possibility of God's sacramental presence, but also forms the basis for eschatology and the idea of eternal life. What needs to be added or concretized, however, is that this presence is the presence of the triune God mediated by the Spirit. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are both sustained by the promise of the presence of Christ, whom the Spirit makes present. The prayers in both sacraments aim at this becoming present of Christ via the Spirit. The peculiarity of the Spirit's action is that the Spirit conveys communion with Christ in differentiation from the Spirit, which occurs on two levels. First, the community is symbolized in the differentiation between Christ and the recipients of the symbolic acts um, or sacraments. Second, the community is symbolized in the differentiation between the celebrants. This, this differentiation occurs in baptism in that the congregation is ideally present and confesses its pay, uh, faith with the person being baptized. Baptism has a fundamentally communal dimension because the individual is taken into the community of the body of Christ. The theme of baptism is, however, the new identity of the individual person in Christ and the claiming one's entire journey of life. In the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the theme is communion. More precisely, the communion of the individual with Christ and the communion of the celebrants with one another. Both symbol uh, symbolic acts or sacraments symbolize in different ways salvation through, uh, through Christ. They thus symbolize the knowledge of sin and grace that Jesus instituted through the Spirit in his life. At the same time, they establish communion in different temporal dimensions. Baptism establishes the community of life with Christ and the church. The Lord's Supper, <coughs> the community of the whole life of the baptized. The Lord's Supper is an experience of the presence of Christ in the spirit here and now with a view toward future communion. Baptism and Lord's Supper refer to each other and dif through, through different temporal perspectives configure the experience of God's presence for the individual and the community as a redeeming and res a reconciling presence. It is the connection of these dimensions that is important for my argument throughout these lectures. It is characteristic of the creative, or more precisely, the renewing work, work of the spirit in human beings to which the New Testament bears witness. It is about the concrete individual and communal knowledge and experience of redemption and reconciliation. Since baptism and the Lord's Supper convey this concrete knowledge and experience, it is understandable that they were called later Sacramenta Majora, in the doct uh, theological doctrine, wherein the, uh, they are differentiated from the other five sacraments celebrated in the Roman Catholic Church and also in Orthodox churches, thus presenting a differentiated status than works of the spirits uh, such as speaking in tongues, healing, or exorcism. The plurality of spiritual gifts and the task of theology. The effects of the spirit have always been a divisive issue in the history of Christianity. The need, indeed the longing, to experience the spirit directly and thus become certain of God's presence is admirable. It testifies the, uh, to the vitality of the Christian faith, necessitating the spirit. In the Pentecostal and charismatic movements, forms of experiencing the spirit have been and continue to be rediscovered in part, newly discovered as being mentioned in the New Testament. Even the baptism in the spirit and speaking in tongues have faded into the background for a long time. The rediscovery of the spirit and its manifold effects is part of the signature of modern forms of Christianity that free themselves from doctrinal and colonial standards. In my view, academic theology has two tasks here. One is 
self-criticism and self-enlightenment about power structures, which churches and theologies have built either intentionally or unintentionally to support or build up themselves, thereby suppressing diversity and curtailing Christian freedom. The other task consists in a constructive discussion about the theological questions in the background of the different forms of piety. Fortunately, this dimension has been a topic of discussion in ecumenically oriented dialogues for several decades. The dialogue between Pentecostals and the Roman Catholic Church began in 1970. It was not on, on, until 19, uh, 19, uh, 1996 that the dialogue between Pentecostals and Reformed followed suite. The first round, um, 1996 to 2000, was concluded with the report Word and Spirit, Church and World, and the re second report from the second round um, uh, until 2011 is about experience in Christian faith and life, worship, discipleship, discernment, community, and justice. In Germany, a working group of the Protestant Church in Germany, cha the Chamber of Global Ecumenism, has been studying Pentecostalism and has published the text Pentecostalism and Charismatization in 2021, which will soon be published in English. There are many methodological difficulties in planning the dialogues, not only of which have to do um, <clears throat> not, last, not least of which have to do with the large plurality of forms of Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity. Nevertheless, these dialogues are necessary for both sides to learn from each other and to work through the tensions that exist in many, in many places. From my theological perspective, it is necessary to recognize and appreciate the richness and diversity of spiritual experiences. I regard dialogues between churches also as a medium of the spirit and fruits of dialogue which help to reconcile churches. In this regard, academic theolog uh, theology has the task of supporting and equipping people in the church and in dialogue in their responsibility for a right and accountable proclamation of the gospel. For right and accountable, accountable proclamation from a Protestant perspective, the doctrine of justification provides the criteria. According to the testimony of the New Testament witness, especially Paul, justification is by, um, <coughs> uh, is by faith alone, without works or merits, which means, on the one hand, that spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues or the gift of healing, cannot be raised as conditions for judging the spiritual qualification of a person. There is no indication in the Bible that only people who speak in tongues have received the Spirit. Instead, it is important to know the, uh, note the context of, uh, for recognizing and appreciating spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues or healing. In the New Testament, the gift of tongues does not stand on its own. Only when interpreted can it, uh, this life of the Spirit be a benefit to the community. The proclamation of the gospel, including the symbolic acts of baptism and breaking the bread, forms the hermeneutical horizon for the knowledge and practice of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts may be expressed in multiple forms, such as tongues and healings, but these do not in themselves legitimize the authority of the person using them. In light of the doctrine of justification, the preaching of the prosperity gospel is to be avoided since the promise of the presence of ble and blessing of the spirit is shown to be real only by the economic success of the believers. Thus, it makes such success as a condition of spirits present. Pneumatologically, the variety of spiritual gifts show uh, the diversity the spirit works on all levels of life. However, this diversity does not aim at separation, but an enabling living communion with the God who has revealed God's self in Jesus Christ as the gracious and merciful God. Grace opens a realistic view of the reality of human beings, which is marked not only by goodwill and human humanitarianism, 
but by self-centered and self-interest. Where the connection between grace and sin falls out of view, the Spirit's work is not understood as redemptive nor reconciling. The reconciliation established by God in the, in the mediation of the Spirit implies insight into transgression, failure, separation, and hostility. At the center of Christian pneumatology, therefore, are the mediums of the Spirit mediating a community in which not only the grace of the Spirit, but also sin is made known, which is the way in which God reconciles humans with him and among each other. This cannot happen without the media through which people are brought together by the reconciling Spirit. Thank you.